I told you I was gonna do it. I told you I was gonna get him tattooed on me, and I finally did. For episode three of Extinct, I'm covering Dimetrodon, arguably the most iconic animal alive during the Permian period. You've probably heard of them before, or at least recognized them by their sail, or the spines going down their back. They've been featured in the Jurassic World TV show, probably Land Before Time, any generic dinosaur franchise shit. Whatever exists, I'm willing to bet Dimetrodon is in it. But here's the thing, Dimetrodon was not a dinosaur. They were alive about 40 million years before the first dinosaurs even evolved. And probably one of the coolest things about them is that they are more closely related to us and all other mammals than they were to reptiles and dinosaurs. Because Dimetrodon is a synapsid, which is the group that would eventually give rise to mammals. This is our great, 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 great uncle. And I think that is sick. They look sick, their evolutionary history is sick, and that makes for a great tattoo. So. Without further ado, my name is Lindsay Nicole, and this is Extinct. Extinct. It is gonna wrap a little bit, but I think that might be fun because we want it to have levels and dimension. Dimension? I don't know. Dimension? Dimension? Yes. Ooh. Let's get the general information out of the way. Like I said, Dimetrodon is a synapsid, the group that would eventually give rise to our mammalian lineage. They were alive during the Permian period about 280 million years ago. If you're familiar with the Permian period, you'll know it ended in the most devastating mass extinction animal life has ever seen. That we know of, called the Great Dying. Up to 96% of all life got wiped out, and the survivors were left to rebuild ecosystems from the ground up. Luckily for Dimetrodon, this was about 25 million years after they were around. So, comparatively, for them, Life was pretty swell. Supercontinent Pangaea was in full swing, and the world was technically in an ice age with ice at the poles. Permian global residents at the time were experiencing seasonal variations, and habitats near the equator were generally pretty dry, because Pangaea was big as fuck, as you probably know, so made the middle all dry. There were some pretty sick plants like Lepidodendron, Sigillaria, Glossopteris, etc. There were some pretty cool amphibians alive, like Eriops. Pretty fucking massive for an amphibian, at about six feet long, right here, but in length, and 400 pounds. That's big, that's big for an amphibian. That's huge, actually. There was also Diplocalis, very cute. Iconic for their boomerang-shaped head. There was also Xenocanthus, my neighbor was there, but I didn't crouch. That's progress, that's progress. I didn't, I didn't hide, I just stopped talking. Okay, there's also Xenocanthus, an early freshwater relative to modern day sharks, and Mesosaurs, first reptiles to transition back to the water, that we know of. There were other synapsids as well, like the tank, Catilorhynchus, which looks like a tunnel system came to life, and Adaphosaurus. It had a sail kind of like Dimetrodon, but Adaphosaurus was different, as I will come to explain in a second. An extremely short list for such a long stretch of time, I know. But it's time to get to the star of the show. I love when shit rhymes and I don't mean for it to. It's like I do this professionally. As you would probably expect and hope, Dimetrodon was pretty big. Small species got to about six feet long. <laughs> that way, with the largest up to 14 or 15 feet. That's pretty fucking big. That's, that's the length of this room. This new room is like 11 feet wide and 14 feet deep. That is the depth of this room. That's pretty big. You hear that echo? That's because it's so big and I haven't filled it with shit yet. That's Dimetrodon's length, enough to echo. I think another reason why people think Dimetrodon is a dinosaur is because of the sprawled out stance. It's a very ancestral reptilian stance. Eventually synapsids would have a more upright leg posture with the limbs situated underneath the body rather than spread out for better support. They're thought to have been the dominant carnivore of their ecosystems, eating amphibians like the big ass Eriops and other synapsids like Catilorhynchus and Adaphosaurus. Cause yeah, Adaphosaurus was an herbivore. Dimetrodon was a carnivore and that makes for a sick tattoo. So far we've got one herbivore, two carnivores for a total of three. The discovery of Dimetrodon goes all the way back to 1845 on Prince Edward Island in Canada. A farmer found a portion of an upper jaw, which was analyzed by scientists and described as a new species of dinosaur, Bathynathus borealis. And at the time, they thought they had found the oldest dinosaur ever. This obviously turned out to not be the case. This was way before dinosaurs, and so this was not a dinosaur at all. Much later, these remains became connected to specimens found in 1875 in Texas by a paleontologist named Edward Drinker Cope. Edward Drinker Cope, it's a good name. Throughout the late 1800s, their classification was tossed around a bit. One thing became certain, Dimetrodon was not a fucking dinosaur. Like I said, this is like the fourth time now. Can I take a step back on it? Just see from across the room and be like, oh, that's a dinosaur. Sorry, not a dinosaur. She's mammalian. Yes. She's mammalian? Almost. More closely related to mammals, it's 100%. a stem mammal. 
mammal. Stem mammal. A stem mammal is an early offshoot on the way to mammals. So not a true mammal. It's the like mammal startup or what? It's like a cousin to the first mammals. They were still laying eggs. They didn't have any Ooh, fur. Ooh, they had eggs. Mm -hmm. But not a dinosaur. Despite the toy sets you might have at home, this was a synapsid. So let me explain what that actually means. I know they pretty much look like some sort of reptile. And I guess they kind of were. But not. But kind of. But not. But kind of. But not. Back in the Carboniferous period, about 320 million years ago, a major split happened in the common ancestor between mammals and reptiles. This is deep time shit. We're talking about the first animals to have hard covered eggs, amniotic eggs, on the ground rather than in the water. And then they started doing different shit. One direction, mammals. Another direction, reptiles, dinosaurs, etc. In the fossil record, there's one major way to identify which animals on which side of the split. And it's the presence of an opening in the skull behind the orbit or eye socket. This opening is called the temporal fenestra. This second hole right here behind the eye hole, this is called a temporal fenestra. The ancestors of mammals, they all have a single temporal fenestra. All mammals alive today have a single temporal fenestra, as in a, a pair of them. We still do. That's something that all mammals have today and did back then as well. This single pair of temporal fenestra are thought to have allowed for the expansion of jaw muscles, opened up the ability to process a variety of foods. And yeah, now all mammals today have a single set of temporal fenestra, one behind each eye socket. The whole synapsid lineage that led to mammals can be traced in the fossil record by the presence of a single set of temporal fenestra, which is fucking sick in my opinion. All sauropsids on the other side, the group that gave rise to dinosaurs, reptiles, birds, do not have a single temporal fenestra. They have either zero or two. If it has zero, it's an anapsid, or two, diapsid, the more you know. One of the earliest synapsids that we know of is called Archaeothyrus. It was about 20 inches long and had a sharp pair of enlarged canines, so most likely a carnivore. I know it looks more like an ancestor to a lizard rather than any mammal, which is definitely due to that sprawling stance. Like I said, the OG trait. They were alive about 25 million years before Dimetrodon, and within that time, synapsids were making some evolutionary moves towards the more mammalian features we're familiar with today. They were still laying eggs, the ancestral trait, and they didn't seem to have fur, which would come later, but they did have more specialized teeth, and it seems like they were developing thermoregulation. Let's start with the teeth. A key aspect of mammals is their specialized teeth, different teeth for different things. That was definitely happening for Dimetrodon. Matter of fact, their mouths just looked completely fucked up. Angel even said she had to keep triple checking the skulls because it seemed so off. But Dimetrodon and their relatives were doing their best with this early experimentation with specialized teeth. Can't help but be fucked up. Dimetrodon was kind of on the way there. Like there's some slightly longer teeth. That's not a reptile thing. Reptiles typically have just all the same kind of tooth going on. Had a ton of new shit going on. Incisors for gripping, canines for stabbing, recurved rear teeth for shearing, and teeth on the roof of their mouth to pin prey. Let me check that. It was in my notes, but damn, apparently. Okay. Later species even had serrated teeth, making them the earliest terrestrial carnivore with serrated teeth that we know of. It seems to have been a response to going after larger prey with tougher skin to pierce through. There is some fossil evidence that they were cannibalizing each other too. I guess these specialized teeth made that easier for them. So an adaptation with some devastating consequences, I guess. Now, what about the thermoregulation? First off, what the fuck is thermoregulation? You now people refer to some animals as warm-blooded or cold-blooded, like cats are warm-blooded, koi, and snakes are cold-blooded. Cats are warm-blooded because they produce and maintain their own internal body temperature, their endotherms, heat inside. Snakes are cold-blooded because their body temperature is dependent on their environment, their ectotherms, heat outside. Tino has a lovely heating pad for that very reason. Ectotherms are the default, as you would probably guess. Invertebrates, fishes, amphibians, and reptiles are all ectotherms, generally. Endothermic groups, like the major groups, evolved only twice that we know of, birds and mammals. But again, that's generally. Nature never gives shit to you straight. Cold-blooded and warm-blooded is actually a lot more complex, but is unnecessary to get into now. And I was talking about making a video about it probably a year ago. It's still on the list. We'll get into it. We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> when exactly endothermy evolved in the ancestors of mammals and birds, i.e. synapsids and sauropsids, is still a bit of a mystery. For the synapsids specifically, it's thought that the roots must be somewhere during the Permian. So the ideas of the function of Dimetrodon's sail have that in mind. Blood pumped into the sail, might have been warmed up, basking in the sun, or cooled down in a nice breeze. The spines are grooved to support blood vessels, so. It's a pretty solid idea. A study in 1973 estimated how long it would take Dimetrodon to heat up in the sun with and without the sail, based on heating seen in American alligators. They found it would take 
205 minutes to go from 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit without the sale. 205 minutes with the sale, 80. More than sliced it in half. So that would be sick, if true. And it seems like it is. The sale probably allowed Dimetrodon to be active and hunt during the times of the day that their prey were still tired and sluggish, perhaps early in the morning, perhaps later in the day as well. Great trait to hunt more efficiently, thus survive more, thus become more and more extreme as time went on. And that's evolution. Do you have a Dimetro Dimetrodon, Dimetrodon joke? Mm, no. I got it. Here's what you do. You just look at this part and then you insert sail by AWOL Nation. It's like, sail. Yeah. That's the joke. That's good. So what are some other early synapsids from this time? I mentioned a couple really quick at the top, Tillerhynchus and Adaphosaurus. Despite having a sail that seems like it's just like Dimetrodon's, fossil evidence suggests these evolved independently, which is pretty sick. Adaphosaurus' spines had humps on them. Dimetrodon's were smooth. Like I said, Adaphosaurus was an herbivore and a very lovely buffet to Dimetrodon. Pretty typical synapsid on synapsid crime. Another synapsid you might like is Euchamber C. amirabilis, potentially the oldest venomous vertebrate ever found. The synapses were fucking on one during the Permian. The consensus is a little bit shaky, just so you know. Over the last like hundred years, it's been quite the debate. The most recent micro CT scans done in 2022 suggest their teeth were capable of housing venomous glands. So it's looking pretty good as of right now, looking pretty sick. And another weird synapsid, Seminia, also known as the Permian primate, primate, because they seem to have lived their life in the trees. Their bodies were about 20 inches long and they had a long, slender tail. That was about 120% of their body length. They also had very long fingers and huge hands compared to their arms with claw-like bones at the end of their fingers. They even had their first digit set off at an angle, kind of like an opposable thumb, the OG, almost opposable thumb, pretty cool. There were also Gorgonopsids, which I feel like if you watch my channel, you must like them because they look like the pit bull saber tooth cats of the Permian period, like a solid mix of the two. They were also considered some of the dominant predators of the time and used their saber teeth to deliver slashing bites to their prey and intimidate their competitors. And what a perfect time to shout out other saber teeth we've covered in the last episode and in the second episode of the History of Cats, which you should check out if you haven't yet, if you want to cue something up to watch after this, because now this tattoo is finally done. We're done. It looks, it looks, it looks so sick. It looks pretty cool. I love this, like, kind of like all these like ribs yeah. and all the bones. It's really satisfying. Oh my God. Whoa. <laughs> oh, wowee. Tell me how you're feeling. First of all, you look cool. Lindsay has five appointments in like two months. It's a really quick way to get your leg tattooed. <laughs> me nodding. So that's fun when I get to like piece things together like big chunks at a time and then it has that big payoff of like, look how many tattoos I have. You know? And it looks absolutely sick. I love the depth Angel was able to add to it. And I also love that I was able to get the sail because the sail is like the sickest thing. And I'm so happy to have Dimetrodon finally tattooed on me. Like I said, I would one day. I like that it's on the outside of my leg. So when I walk past a reflection, I can see it. It's sick. And now I can't wait to show you the next one because the rest of them are already done. I split up going to Portland in two trips. First trip, I did Diabloceratops and Smilodon. The second trip, I did Three. It was quite a week that got more and more painful over time, but worth it. Very worth it. I can't wait to show you the next one. I'm gonna give you a very general hint. It's an ape. Could be any ape. I would love to hear your guesses. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. A huge thanks to Angel for this tattoo that I'm so proud to be showing off. Check out my Patreon for behind the scenes updates, live streams, and our Discord server. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya.